Welcome to the Phase World Podcast. Engaging conversations that cross the boundaries between business, art, and the digital world. Welcome back to the Phase World Podcast. This is episode number 11. It's a new milestone for me. And this is part two with Michael O'Malley. In part one, if you haven't listened to it, I highly recommend that you do so. In that episode, we talked about the first defining competition for Mr. O'Malley's career as a U.S. team member, as a captain, and really going back to when he was a young boy, you know, what it's like to train 10 to 12 hours a day, and what is the process to be selected for the U.S. team. And Mr. O'Malley really relates to his experience in Taekwondo competitions of the highest caliber and also shares the relationships he formed with his teammates. Anyway, in this episode, you will actually learn about the Taekwondo school Mr. O'Malley founded where he continues his teaching as the principal instructor today. I myself, uh, I'm still benefiting from the training and I very much look forward to my practice multiple times a week. So let me tell you a few things about O'Malley Taekwondo Center. It teaches traditional martial art and practical self-defense for men, women, and children. The program is an individualized and comprehensive approach to helping students achieve their fitness level. So in other words, instead of only focusing a, on a student's strength, Mr. O'Malley actually helps overcome his or her unique challenges. Ms. Romali created a unique program to teach children and adults how to be confident and powerful on the inside and out. In addition to Taekwondo hand and kicking techniques, Ms. Romali has made self-defense module a requirement for all of us. During day and summer camps um, at the center, Ms. Romali creates workshops for young campers to practice power poses, learn extensive self-protection strategy, and participate in anti bully programs conducted by police officers. I also want to mention that beyond Taekwondo practice, Ms. Romali has introduced a line of extraordinary people who teach his students in a variety of subjects and skills. So without further ado, I'm sure you're eager to learn all about Ms. Romali's school, and here comes Michael O'Malley. <music> today I think when we start talking about education overcoming fear um, you've started a school about th over three and a half years ago here in Peabody uh, Massachusetts now this is about I don't know exactly but perhaps 15 20 miles from uh, downtown Boston and you opened up this wonderful school that you know many of your students from 20, 30, 40 years ago are still following you uh, to this location, uh, regardless of the distance um, to their homes. So do you mind giving us uh, an overview of this? So I, I want the audience to kind of hear that from you, what the school is about and uh, you know the type of members and perhaps if you know, some of some of them are interested in meeting you in person, considering your instruction. Uh, how do they find you? As you said, we opened up about three and a half years ago. Um, of course, you know, I've been teaching Taekwondo for over 40 years now. Mm -hmm. And um, I've trained um, anywhere from a four-year-old child, mm -hmm. you know, to an 85-year-old woman, mm -hmm. uh, to Olympic athletes. Mm -hmm. um, the type of system that I develop, it may be you know, uh, somewhat surprising because we've been just talking about competition stuff for a while here, mm. is um, I really don't teach it in terms of competition uh, at all. Mm. And um, so in effect, I'm teaching more the traditional base system, the original approach mm -hmm. that was created by General Che and the original approach that we utilized in Boston during the early 70s. Uh, with emphasis on practical, no nonsense mm -hmm. um, techniques, and of course, you know, practical self defense, mm -hmm. self protection skills, as we like to call it, um, with um, with this 
original or balanced approach that is um, utilizing your your hands and your feet mm -hmm. um, as opposed to just being one dimensional mm -hmm. and using what's best mm -hmm. uh, with emphasis on power and speed and precision. Mm -hmm. And the school opens seven days a week. I know it's hard for most people to imagine how much work that it's involved. Not only that, unlike uh, many other schools that I, you know, I, I have, um, I'm not as familiar with, but um, knowing their names or schedule that you've implemented a very aggressive schedule. Um, the school has over 40 classes, 35, 40 classes a week targeting different levels. Um, so why is that approach? It's basically an institution. It's a center that opens all day. Yeah. Well, there's, there's two reasons. One mm -hmm. is, of course, I wanted to make it um, convenient for people to come. And so the seven-day-a-week routine mm -hmm. um, does just that, enables members to come in and fit it into their schedule. Mm -hmm. um, of course, up here I have a lot of children as well, and parents are working. Up here it's a blue-collar area, mm -hmm. um, so you got very often two parents working mm -hmm. and so we have classes basically from 3.30 until 9 o'clock at night it's just continuous classes mm -hmm. and so it gives them a chance to come in um, when it's convenient mm -hmm. um, and then what it also does is for people um, that really develop a, a strong passion for it much like what I did mm -hmm. and, and others that I was associated with um, at the Boston School um, it gave them a chance to really pursue mm -hmm. um, developing their Taekwondo skills in a much faster, mm -hmm. broader fashion, as opposed to them being only able to come in a couple of days a week mm -hmm. at prearranged times that most schools mm -hmm. have their schedules set up. Um, it is, you know, very labor intensive. I, I um, it to to run the school in that way, but. I, th I think the main thing is that I, I really find a lot of joy and passion mm -hmm. in doing what I do, and it hasn't changed. I mean, mm -hmm. I feel as passionate today as I did when I first walked into school as a 14-year-old and started my first class, mm -hmm. and I find a lot of joy in teaching. Um, even just the very simplest movements, mm -hmm. uh, the most rudimentary steps to a five-year-old white belt kid or, mm -hmm. you know, a 40-year-old executive, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so while that passion is still there for me, um, I don't see myself doing anything else. You know, mm -hmm. it's a circle of love, and I, I decided that uh, if we're going to be open, then we should just be open to the community as, as often as we can. and. And it'll give people a chance to work out as frequently as they want. And, mm -hmm. you know, the cream will rise to the top. And then you'll have those others that want to just practice, you know, two or three times a week mm -hmm. um, at their pace. And that's quite all right, too. You yeah. know, we're not looking to, to train, you know, Olympic athletes, you know. Mm -hmm. We're just trying to improve people's uh, lives. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, and I completely echo that feedback as a, as personally as a practitioner of Taekwondo for nearly 14 years now, it's, it's time really flies. And I remember after practicing Taekwondo for about five years, four or five years after getting my uh, first degree black belt, uh, I didn't feel a sense of arrogance. Uh, obviously, there are other black belts uh, in the community as well, but I did feel part of myself slowing down. And that somehow changed very drastically um, when you came to the school when I was able to learn from you and then all of a sudden all my techniques including the very basic ones were improving so drastically um, I feel like part of me is uh, relearning Taekwondo on a on a whole new level so I I think while your passion is still here I would highly encourage people um, at every age level men or women adult or children to um, consider this fantastic opportunity because I think it's really um, it's a privilege for the North Shore Massachusetts community to have someone like you and to be able to learn from you directly. And one of the things I found is um, I also um, you may be surprised to hear too I mean I have that passion but I also had to reinvent myself mm -hmm. in some ways um, as an instructor mm -hmm. um, because when I was teaching in these other locations in Boston and in Cambridge 
really didn't have a lot of children. Mm -hmm. And um, up here in, in Peabody, you know, we we have um, the children's program um, is is doing really well. Mm -hmm. And um, so I had to find ways in order to engage children. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And one of the strategies I decided is when I opened up the school, and this is one of the things I think that separates us from, from other martial arts schools, is I decided not to dumb down mm -hmm. the techniques that we teach kids mm -hmm. and, and, the, and the method in which we teach kids. And so I made a decision that I was going to teach everything um, similar to what we teach adults mm -hmm. in terms of the techniques. Now, teaching classes are a little bit different in terms of the design of the classes because we want to make it, kids want to have fun. So we do things mm -hmm. that are fun that I wouldn't maybe do with adults. Mm -hmm. So you make it fun and interesting and sometimes you're goofy, sometimes you're serious and you got to mm -hmm. kind of know when to be one or the other. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, and, and adults are always, you know, very serious, you mm -hmm. know, teach me learn, you know, and, and, you know, with kids, you know, you can teach them something, you know, you teach this five-year-old green belt kid how to do a particular technique and mm -hmm. you tell him, okay, now I want you to work on that, you know, um, for the mm -hmm. next five, ten minutes in mm -hmm. front of the mirror. Mm -hmm. As soon as you turn your back and they're running down mm -hmm. the end of the doljang mm -hmm. and they come flying by you doing a flying sidekick, something mm -hmm. totally different than you asked them to do. <laughs> and then they're off on their own. <laughs> so that's different. Mm -hmm. But they still need to, when they, in order to progress to the ranks, they still have to perform techniques as, as the same as we, we expect the adults to do. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I have a lot of respect for that because some of the Taekwondo forms <laughs> as we all know, are quite complex, even for adults. And I've witnessed uh, kids age six, seven, eight years old really practicing with you, and then sometimes on their own, and I will be observing these tests, and I'm stunned what they could do. And I'm sure their parents feel even more so that way, and I, I think they it's a very, very special experience. Yeah, well, you know, there's the physical component, and it just, it, it does require more effort with um, with children, mm -hmm. um, you do get these special kids who come in who are like mm -hmm. five, but going on like twelve, mm -hmm. you know, or mm -hmm. twelve going on like eighteen. But um, you know, kids are kids, and but you know, there, there are ways of pushing their buttons to get them to perform, mm -hmm. um, and the expectation is there for them to um, elevate the way they think mm -hmm. and for them to. Um, elevate their skills to a certain standard uh, mm -hmm. that we expect mm -hmm. for all ranks. I think uh, one of the areas that you mentioned and I have witnessed um, and parents have witnessed and really benefit a ton from is that you have these uh, parts, you have a very personal approach and you have, you spend time having these heartfelt conversations in my opinion with these children because in this day and age Unfortunately, we've raised children, a generation of children who are extremely sensitive to failure. And meaning, if they watch a Bruce Lee movie, then they cannot immediately perform something in that movie, then they start crying, they start, this, they start to break down. So uh, I've seen those scenarios before, but somehow you're able to turn them around. And these kids are very young, and I'm sure the conversations are not easy to have. So. How do you, why do you do that? And, and how do you do that exactly? And I know parents really appreciate this, this effort, but it's a lot to ask on your end. Well, as I said, the re reinvention part of me <laughs> um, realized how much I actually enjoyed teaching young people. Mm -hmm. As I said, I spent most of my life training elite athletes and uh, adults who were, um, focused and motivated in their own life and we were talking about well people like you for example mm -hmm. but also you know you had professors and mm -hmm. um, famous surgeons and you know these people you know they show up and you show them what to do and you know they're, they're always focused and they'll, they'll do it mm -hmm. um, but you know a lot, I, I take a, a an affection with these kids and um, I can kind of put myself in their shoes and um, the first thing that I want to do is is try to change 
the way they feel inside in terms of being confident. Mm -hmm. And so how do we reach them to do that? And of course, you know, the techniques itself and the success of moving from one rank to the next mm -hmm. uh, lends itself to one becoming more confident, whether you're an adult or a child. Mm -hmm. But I, I learned that you that really needed to do more than that. Mm -hmm. Because I think a lot of schools pay lip service to this, um, where they say they're training kids to be confident, but how do they actually do it? Yeah. The kids come in and they kick and punch and they go through the movements, okay. So maybe there are some kids who are just naturally confident mm -hmm. and they move through the ranks and they, they become pretty good. But what about all these other kids? Not everybody mm -hmm. is confident. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to try to reach out to them on the subconscious level as well. So we talk about feeling powerful. Mm -hmm. And we act it out in class by uh, first introducing themselves, mm -hmm. looking at somebody in the eye, mm -hmm. you know, the warmth and the firmness of their handshake. Mm -hmm. How do they face somebody's shoulders, you know, expanded chin up? Mm -hmm. um, how they walk. Mm -hmm. We actually practice walking mm -hmm. in the school. And, mm -hmm. and kids kind of, oh, yeah, we have fun with it. Um, some kids joke around and so forth and mm -hmm. it kind of breaks down and it gets to be pretty funny sometimes. <laughs> um, but there's a purpose behind it. Mm -hmm. um, I want them to feel powerful even if and, and show power on the outside, their self-image. Mm -hmm. um, you know, bullying is a huge problem mm -hmm. these days huge. and I don't think it's much different than when I was growing up. You know, just in the old days if somebody yeah. bothered me in school I'd punch them in the face and <laughs> you know, my brothers would join in. Um, but you know, kids are not taught to be aggressive like this, and we don't teach kids to be aggressive. But we also teach them that they have a right to be left alone. Yeah. Um, they have um, no one should put their hands on them. Mm -hmm. And you know, newspapers are filled of stories of teachers getting, you know, uh, beaten and even killed up here mm -hmm. in Danvers. A young young girl oh, in her twenties yeah. was was. Yeah. was um, killed in, in, in Danvers and and it really hits home because mm -hmm. if these kids can learn how to uh, project this power and confidence from the outside mm -hmm. the chances are uh, decrease dramatically that somebody is going to bother them. Yeah, I think it's very true um, during our self-defense programs and seminars and um, you had mentioned that these predators will look for cues, you know, when they're on the street, and they typically look for people who appear to be less confident or very distracted on their phones. And I think even as an adult woman myself, you know, working in downtown, that's something, because of Taekwondo, I remind myself every day when I leave work, when I go to work, uh, I'm very conscious of it. You know, oh, that's good to hear. Um, yeah. You know, that's part of the self-defense strategies that we teach. Mm -hmm. uh, specific, you know, strategies. Um, there was um, just a quick story. There was a, um, a study done um, by some some social group done through the prison system throughout the U.S. Mm -hmm. And they uh, had asked questions uh, to guys who were in prison for you know, robberies and assaults. Mm -hmm. um, and they wanted to find out um, how they actually chose their victims. Mm -hmm. And make a long story short, they what, what ended up happening is they found out that um, a huge majority of people pick their victims mm -hmm. based on how they walked. Mm -hmm. By how they walked. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you walk down the street and you can just imagine the head is down, mm -hmm. you know, you're not paying attention, mm -hmm. um, you you know, you're distracted, you got things in your hands, things that they probably want, you know, mm -hmm. iPhones and all this, mm -hmm. um, versus somebody who's walking down the street that's attentive, that looks confident. Um, mm -hmm. And instead of choosing that confident person, they would choose the unconfident looking mm -hmm. person. Mm -hmm. And um, and that's pretty eye-opening because you know when I teach you know these children, 
um, these are one of the things that we we really stress mm -hmm. is their body image you know mm -hmm. what does your image give off what does it tell others about you mm -hmm. and so we work on what we call power poses mm -hmm. I actually asked them to stand up and show me mm. a pose mm -hmm. that um, depicts power and confidence. Mm -hmm. And you know, you get all some of it's pretty funny. <laughs> <laughs> you know, some kid puts two of his hands on top of his head, and you know, <laughs> while standing there, and then the other kid, you know, he's in a fighting stance, which is not what we want them to do. Uh -huh. uh, we just want them to be in a neutral posture. Yeah, uh -huh. But you know, they get pretty creative and imaginative. Um, but the whole point is 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 your body language and what does it say about you mm -hmm. and so we work on these power poses and taekwondo as a as a system and like most martial arts um, the simple movements done in front of a mirror um, are actually power poses whether we're thinking about it or not mm -hmm. um, but it takes on more meaning especially for children mm -hmm. um, so we work on that. Even if you're not feeling powerful inside, you know, mm -hmm. if we have them make a small speech in front of a small group of kids, mm -hmm. you could be nervous as heck inside, but you project outside mm -hmm. that you, you have power, mm -hmm. you know, that you look confident. I think in addition to teaching um, kids to be very powerful, and one of the observations I had is you also respect um, a lot of their individuality. Not every kid is the same physically, they're built differently. Um, you know, some kids are naturally very athletic, some of the other ones not as much. But you've taken each one of them in and, and really teach them equally and um, really, uh, you know, create a system, really tailor a program to their individual needs. Yeah, well, I, you know, I, I, this has always been a teaching mm -hmm. philosophy anyways, no matter who it was, mm -hmm. what age they were. Um, you know, we're not turning out assembly line robots. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, you do, as a teacher, I believe any teacher that's good probably mm -hmm. thinks the same way I do, mm -hmm. um, that, you know, you have to look at the individual themselves and look at their strengths and weaknesses and find out what makes them tick, what motivates them. Mm -hmm. um, so I try to give all the kids... Um, you know, as much you know personal time as mm -hmm. I can but you know as the school grows it becomes a little bit harder on an individual basis um, mm -hmm. which is why you know we we have other instructors that are trained you know to yes. do that too. Speaking of uh, other instructors uh, one of the very unique opportunity you've brought to the North Shore community is your connection through some of the world famous musicians, artists, athletes of course and you've introduced them, you've embedded them in your school. Um, if I were to name a few of those, you know, uh, Ralph Peterson Jr., who's an instructor and, uh, you know, a jazz musician and um, some of your um, very, uh, basically, uh, U.S. team friends as well, um, and also someone like my mom, who's an artist, and we all play a, a very significant, uh, significant part at the school and I think in turn, the children are exposed to different skills, different cultures, uh, different ethnicities, uh, perhaps, you know, um, not every, uh, every family here is connected to um, a family of a different culture. But I think you really build a um, learning experience, a very unique learning experience for them. Yeah, well, again, that goes, uh, again, with the reinvention uh, <laughs> with myself, but also the way I think about a school should be within a community mm -hmm. um, and I, I believe a school should teach so much more than just how to kick and punch there's so much more that we could do as instructors and as martial arts schools not just like one of those schools mm -hmm. um, that would benefit the community as a whole mm -hmm. I mean majority of students within a, a school um, come from within a one mile to one and a half mile radius. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, three quarters of the members, right? Mm -hmm. So it's within that basic framework that you try to create a community. Um, and one of the things that, of course, you know, you and and, and Ralph and, and Adam and 
Ivan and, and the others that have been up to the school mm -hmm. uh, that have known me for a long time, mm -hmm. um, you bring a special, very special element um, to these people's lives. Mm -hmm. And you're right, you know, it's a chance for them to maybe experience things that they haven't. I mean, in their normal public schools, mm -hmm. there's very little in the way of music. Mm -hmm. There's very little in the way of um, developing as an individual. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you're kind of expected um, to be that way, for example, like sport teams at schools, mm -hmm. um, whether it's team or an individual sport, mm -hmm. when you participate in these sports, you're expected mm -hmm. to be focused. Mm -hmm. You're expected to be um, a leader. You're expected to have confidence, mm -hmm. right? Um, very little is taught in terms of that aspect. Mm -hmm. But the way I look at it is that's why we exist as a school mm -hmm. to provide that to the community. Mm -hmm. So there are not that many places you can really think of um, that you can send a child and have them learn mm -hmm. how to be confident. Mm -hmm. How can I make my child more focused, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so that's why schools like ours would exist and I think that helps the community at large. So providing um, um, access to someone like Ralph Peterson, who's a world famous jazz drummer and, and, and plays the trumpet, and he's a professor at uh, Berkeley College of Music, mm -hmm. um, yeah, it, it's a blessing to have him at the school. Mm -hmm. um, and the kids get a chance to experience learning from someone of his caliber. Mm -hmm. um, of course, you and your mom with um, God-given talents of, of art and uh, and yeah no in Chinese language I was getting to a Chinese language uh -huh. um, you just have a uh, unique way of relating uh, to the members mm -hmm. um, and we expand the way that they think you, know, you expand them their way of thinking of Chinese la language and Chinese culture mm -hmm. um, they get to see these beautiful works of art uh, that Tracy. Mm -hmm. uh, has provided mm -hmm. um, that your mom has has um, has developed for our school mm -hmm. and has taught the kids um, and um, this uh, it, this will last for the rest of their lives and I'm sure it makes an impact on on most of the kids and so it's one way for the school to be a center of learning mm -hmm. center of culture and a center of community learning culture and community Right. And then one example I could think of, I for some reason I could never forget this moment, is um, I think either our first or second anniversary, and it was immediately after, it was a ceremony, was held after uh, one of the, the test, rank tests that we had, and a little five or perhaps six year old was carrying the chair and it was way bigger than he was, and he was helping with a clean up enthusiastically, putting things away, you know, serving cakes to members, and his parents were asking him, like, how come you never do this at home? And what is going on here? He's like, Dad, this is a place of great meaning. That I am here to do something <laughs> <laughs> at home that's not very significant. <laughs> so I, I think because of that behavior, they influence um, other kids as well. Right? When we think about if with the little kids look at me as an adult woman, we're saying, okay, you do this it's less relatable versus another five, another six year old doing this. And they might start to question, you know, some of the behaviors at home. And we talked about um, bullying, but uh, and also at the school, even when bullying is not involved, school can be a tough place to be. And I hear some of the conversations when the kids come to uh, our school of the challenges they've had, the things that the kids would say to each other. And those are forbidden words at, at your school. You know, you um, the kids know that they're not allowed to make fun of one another. They have to respect each other. They have to help each other. And today when I walk into the school, um, it, it's teamwork and collaboration. We talked about individuality, but also teamwork that you are helping kids, you're teaching kids to teach Taekwondo. And the better they teach, the better they learn. And I know that at the beginning, they really, they stutter a little bit, they really struggle. Okay, do this, don't do that. You actually teach, imagine a seven or eight year old how to teach the Taekwondo they know. 
Uh, I think that's really incredible, and I can see them improve on a daily basis. Mm-hmm. You know, even without their parents being observing every every second of it, but they're different people. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, um, yeah. you're raising good citizens. In other words, you know, that's what we need for our community. So, um, so before closing, <laughs> before closing, I I don't want people to leave this podcast with pre or misconceptions of what um, whether Taekwondo is for them or not and a few very common questions I think it's better for you to address okay. um, is for uh, for children some of the parents approach me and ask my kids are not very uh, athletic or coordinated um, you know they haven't really done very well in, in school sports uh, can they join their little naughty and um, what's your advice uh, well um when they come to the school, um, you find that a large percentage of kids are not the types of kids that would fit in to group sports. Mm-hmm. Uh, whether they're just mentally not ready, mm-hmm. um, physically they're maybe not capable of a particular sport. Mm-hmm. Um, but when they come to the school, you'll, you'll, you find that it's those kids that really tend mm-hmm. to do really well. Mm. Um, because Taekwondo, you learn at your pace. Mm-hmm. You're not competing with anyone else. You're competing mm-hmm. with yourself. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a huge part of it. Mm-hmm. I think the competition aspect frightens kids. Mm-hmm. Um, and some kids just are not ready to deal with it. Mm. Uh, whereas when they come and do martial arts, what's expected is that you're just there to do your best. Mm-hmm. And if you don't do great today, you'll do better tomorrow. Mm-hmm. And, um, and of course, you know, that we have ways of um, goal setting for them so mm-hmm. they can move up the ranks and then their confidence increases and their ability increases. Mm-hmm. And then maybe one day they might see themselves as... Um, um, seeing the possibility of even becoming a black belt and beyond. Yeah, thank you. And then, um, uh, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, um, so, you know, the first step to doing any of that is just to come by the school, mm-hmm. and um, or a school if you happen not to be close to where I am and you can't really make it, mm-hmm. is to go and watch a class or two, mm-hmm. and of course meet and talk to the instructors. Mm-hmm. and. Um, I think once you watch, you know, within, you know, five minutes, it'll either, either strike you the right way or it won't. Mm-hmm. Um, but I always felt like the biggest thing is don't look for the place that's the closest to you. Right. Um, I realize convenience is important, but something like this, which can um, deeply affect a, a person's life, mm-hmm. um, is not to be taken lightly. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, it's like, you know, if your child said to you, Mom, I want to quit the fifth grade, mm-hmm. you would sit down and talk to them about why school is important and education is important. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So when it comes to martial arts, it's just as important to find a place that you can mm-hmm. commit yourself to with you, the parent, realizing um that this is something that would be important for their life. Yeah. You know? Mm-hmm. And so you don't want to just give up on it. It shouldn't be a novelty. Mm-hmm. And you would want them to stay with it, mm-hmm. you know? Um, it's just like, you know, a child learning how to swim. I mean, in most cases, I don't know many parents that won't make sure that their child knows how to, to mm-hmm. swim because the inherent dangers of being in the water. Mm-hmm. And on land, you know, you want to make sure that the kids, because of the inherent dangers that are out there as well, Mm -hmm. give them a practical sense of being able to defend themselves Mm -hmm. and then make them strong, powerful, confident, Mm -hmm. you know, kids and young adults and and eventually adults. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. That's a great answer. Um, One of two more common questions. Um, The second one is whether for kids or adults, um, they've, you know, some people started Taekwondo or another form of martial art, I guess that's a little more complex. Uh, They've earned a green or blue belt and they really would like to um, start again. Perhaps it's inspired by this podcast, knowing who you are, 
um, how should they consider about kind of picking it up? Well, um, we start off all new members, whether you've had training or not. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't matter what you've done. Um, we start you with private lessons, so you don't join classes right at the start. Mm -hmm. um, and that gives us a chance to assess if you practiced before, mm -hmm. uh, what your abilities are and what you've practiced. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there may be some um, relearning of particular movements, but quite frankly, when you join a school, you're coming in as a student and your job is to learn. Mm -hmm. um, so whether you have to relearn something or mm -hmm. learn something fresh, um, mm -hmm. nonetheless, you know, you, you come in as, as a student and that, that's what your, your parameters are. Mm -hmm. And um, so as, as long as you're willing to be open to the learning and again, you get a positive frame of mind, mm -hmm. uh, we're going to teach you the best we know how. Mm -hmm. And you take from that um, and, and, mm -hmm. and learn and become good. Yeah, know? exactly. Um, so last question, and thanks for spending the time. I know it's been uh, a long interview so far. The last question is oftentimes with adults. And as an adult, I, you know, I, I hopefully I represent um, a group of people and hopefully encourage them to join in. But I do get questioned a lot, you know, adults in their 30s, 40s, 50s saying, hey, you know, am I, is it too late for me to start? And, um, you know, would I feel awkward as an adult practicing with younger children in a class, which I love, by the way, I love practicing the teenager and even little kids in the class for diversity. So what is, um, you know, how do we address that? Well, first of all, you know, there's um, a myriad of classes that are specifically for adults only. Mm -hmm. um, and then we do offer family classes where the moms and dads and adults, if they choose to come in can practice and you know um, and we, we sometimes I'll have the parents practicing with their kids mm -hmm. which is a whole point of family classes mm -hmm. to just practicing adults and kids because sometimes you know you, you need to mm -hmm. arrange people by mm -hmm. height weight and mm -hmm. experience and all that stuff, you know? mm -hmm. so that's all done that's all inherent within the classes itself mm -hmm. but I would say that look learning never stops mm -hmm. the only time it stops is when we die mm -hmm. So it doesn't matter whether you're 90 years old, you know, mm -hmm. or an 18 year old hockey player, mm -hmm. you know, um, you have the ability to learn. And if you have interest in this, we will teach you, you mm -hmm. know, what, what you need to know. Mm -hmm. And you can learn at your pace and have fun and make friends and, and do something to enrich your life. Mm -hmm. um, you'll develop, if you're interested in learning uh, self-defense, we'll work on um, the self-protection skills and strategies so you can you know kind of walk around mm -hmm. if you're a nurse you know leaving the hospital you know mm -hmm. at 1 a.m. and you're in a, and mm -hmm. walking out to the parking lot and you feel um, a little bit intimidated or frightened mm -hmm. and sometimes you have a right to be mm -hmm. um, we can alleviate some of that mm -hmm. uh, by giving you the proper strategies and training you mm -hmm. um, it doesn't take a long time to learn it. It mm -hmm. just takes some effort, so as long as you don't mind sweating. Mm -hmm. um, it's a great workout. Mm -hmm. um, in some ways, you know, with adults, it's almost like rediscovering your legs again. Mm -hmm. You know, the flexibility mm -hmm. and all the kicking. And mm -hmm. I found that with women, um, leg strength is very similar to men, where upper body strength might be a little bit different. Mm, interesting. And so through Taekwondo, we work on developing these powerful kicking techniques. Mm -hmm. And you'll work on hitting the punching bags and pads so you can see the results of what we teach you. Mm -hmm. um, and, and on top of that, you'll, you'll make, you know, and meet some very interesting people like you and mm -hmm. Ralph and me and, and others, you yeah, know. Yeah, indeed. And I realize that still my best, the, all the best friends I have in my life are from Taekwondo. <laughs> Thank you so much for the interview. It was my pleasure. To listen to more episodes of the Face World podcast, please subscribe on iTunes or visit faceworld.com. That is F E I S W O R L D, where you can find show notes, links, other tools, and resources. You can also follow me on Twitter at Face World. Until next time, thanks for listening.